Beth, uh, most recently in her full-time career, was the global vice chair of EY, overseeing public policy. Um, she has done an amazing number of things. I'll cite just two or three. So um, one is being named to the uh, 100 most powerful women in the world is Forbes list. Nine times. Nine times. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wasn't even sure Forbes had been clued enough to do that list nine times. So um, that, that's absolutely great. And, and in addition to her private sector career, Beth uh, also spent time in the Treasury Department um, during the Clinton administration working on tax and regulatory issues related to health care. That's useful information to have today as well, mm -hmm. useful insight. Um, but the thing I really like, because when I'm not thinking about sustainability, often I, I'm thinking about basketball, and um, Beth is um, in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. And you know, if you know anything about basketball, if you're not from the United States, let me just tell you, in Indiana, there is literally nothing more important than basketball. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah, nothing more important than basketball. So, and she played at Purdue, which is also where my hero, John Wooden, the former coach of UCLA, uh, played as an All-American. So you're you're good with me. This is this is all <laughs> this is all pretty fantastic. Good to know. I just, just and, took that. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a bit um, about um, uh, PGLE, which is, by the way, for Californians in the audience, that's I didn't say PG and E. <laughs> um, PGLE has a much less complicated uh, recent, recent history. The Partnership for uh, Global LGBTI Equality, which BSR is very proud uh, to, to house, and Beth has been driving force and, and leading uh, the, the steering board for, for PGLE. So we'll talk about that. I want to start a little bit, though, with um, just to give people a sense of, of your background and, and, and your leadership. So we'll come back to PGLE uh, before too long. If you want to look, it's, um, the website is global-lgbti.org. Um, but Beth, um, you know, you had a very distinguished career at, at EY. Um, you retired, uh, and you know, air quotes for retired, um, as vice chair of global public policy. Um, and you, you used your position and, and your influence and your role at EY to advocate for gender and LGBT equality. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Um, how you had impact, what some of the challenges were. Hmm. Well, it, thank you, Aaron. It, it's, um, that journey is interesting in that, you know, you, I was out to dinner one night with a girlfriend. So th this is when you have moments that kind of change your, your career, perhaps, and your focus. So Global Vice Chair of Public Policy, 155 countries all over the world dealing with governments. When our profession, after Enron and WorldCom, we went from self-regulated to regulated overnight. And so it was a public policy in, in our profession didn't even exist before Enron and WorldCom. So it was really that, that that put us on our heads. And I kind of just stepped into that role after a long career in tax, doing, doing normal things in the firm. But it was one night, I was out to dinner with a girlfriend, you know, once a quarter, check in, catch up, and she looked across the table at me and she goes, you know what? She goes, you don't do enough for women. Got your attention. It did. I was angry, actually. I looked at her, I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, I can't do, I can't mentor any more individual women. Like, I can't do any more. What are you talking about? She said, you don't get it. You're the global vice chair of public policy. You deal with governments all over the world, and you are mentoring individual women. You could change the world for women if you wanted to. And that was such a huge pivot for me. And that's when I realized the platform that I had which was I was doing my job and I was thinking small. I wasn't playing big. Um, so it really caused me to say, you know what? I could, I really could um, change the world for women if I want. And, and so that was really the, the, the evolution. I remember um, getting up out of a Harvard meeting, uh, a Harvard Women's Leadership Board meeting, a group of women were talking about, this was right after the global financial crisis where Predominantly groupthink had let us off the cliff, and there were a lot of women behind the scenes trying to bring us back and not getting any credit for it. This group of women at Harvard, we were talking, we were very frustrated. We're like, why does anybody understand the business case for diversity? Why does no one understand it? I got up out of the meeting. I'm like, we need to quit talking to ourselves. And I got on the phone. I called Milan Verveer, who was Hillary Clinton's chief of staff, and 
Um, Milan and I were good friends. I said, Milan, I want every piece of research on women and diversity that you have in your office, give it to me. We're writing a report. Like, we're going to get public about this. And that's when we really, and worked with the, the first lady when she became Secretary of State to help change the conversation from, at that time we were talking about women as victims versus women as economic engines of opportunity. So just, it's, you know, the evolution is using your using your platform in a way that can really make a difference on issues that, it wasn't my job, it, but it was clearly um, meaningful to the firm, aligned with our values, and if not, if not me, who, sort of. And uh, it's a great story and a couple of questions to follow on. Did you, so you, you wanted more data, but were you taking ideas you already had and applying them differently, or did it really cause you to think differently about what the opportunity was. It caused me to say, the data is all there. We haven't packaged it in a way that was understandable. The business case hadn't really been made clearly at that time. And so we set about to really um, concretely make the business case. I mean, what's interesting to me is that, you know, corporate America for, you know, in, in some ways been talking about diversity for quite some time, for decades. Mm -hmm. We've had laws in place for say 50 years um, not so much protecting LGBTI rights, we can come back to that later, but on gender and, and, and race and, and national origin, but the culture, do, the culture doesn't change. So you can make all the rules you want, all the standards you want, but culture change is much harder. So how do you think about those different pieces? Well, you, again, you have to, wh why does it need to change? And, and, and that's, I think, a lesson that a lot of companies at that time learned, is we'd been so focused on diversity, we were counting numbers versus the inclusion of making the mix work together. And that's why that research and all the, the statistics at that time were so important is because, because if you talk to populations in your companies, what we found is you'd find a group of people who had worked on diverse teams and had miserable experiences. And then you'd talk to people who worked on diverse teams and had glorious experiences. You couldn't get these people to care about DNI. You couldn't, and you, these people got it. What was the difference? Those, they had participated on teams that were either well-led or not well-led. Non-inclusive leaders, inclusive leaders. And so then the next evolution, I think, for all of us was let's train people how to be better inclusive leaders because it matters. And was this part of your core set of responsibilities or was this a, a something that you were building on top of that? Uh, th then I would just make that happen within the firm. Yeah, never really part of my job. Yeah. All right. Um, we're living in a time when, um, and I just came from a session um, that we were doing on employee activism, and we're living in a time when actually people want to see business leaders step up. What's easy about that? What's hard about that? What advice would you give people in this room to push, challenge, support their most senior leadership to take stands? Oh, you know, I have a voice um, and understand your voice matters. I, I remember uh, for our organization, um, our chair CEO sat on President Trump's policy and strategy committee. I probably don't have the name right now, policy and strategy forum. But at that time, you may recall when Charlottesville happened, the, the 16 CEOs that were on that strategy came under tremendous pressure to resign and us, our CEO being one of it. And our employees were apoplectic. Number one, about him going on it, and number two, about him staying on it at that time. Um, but that's not universally 100% of our employees. We, they were, we were divided. There was a mix. But, but at that time, the voices were so important for the senior leadership to hear the voices of the organization and to interpret and, and to then be really transparent about the decisions and why. To me, we could have made either decision, could have, would have had to. To stay or go. To stay yeah. or go, I really, I'm glad we went, but yeah. if, had we made the decision to stay, we would have just had to explain it so transparently. Um, but we, we were transparent about going on it. Um, I didn't support it, but we, that wasn't, I didn't make the final call, obviously. We went on it. But then we had to be really clear about what we believe in. You got to be at the table. You can't make change if you're not at the table. So we have an opportunity to be at the table. We're going to be there. Yeah. So that's how we explained it. Um, so what advice would you give then to people who are starting their career? And is it fundamentally different for someone who's 25 years old today than 25 years ago? Well, you know, this is the same advice I've given to young people starting their careers forever, which is 
don't try, try use your voice. Try to make change. Be vocal. But if you are part of an organization that the culture does not align with your values, vote with your feet and just leave. I, They'll get the message. Yeah, I think they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Let's let's um, um, shift a little bit to LGBTI issues. So, um, what's the 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 um, There's a character in a Hemingway novel who's asked, um, you know, you went bankrupt. How did that happen? And the the response was gradually and then suddenly. I mean, it seems the same for LGBT rights. Yeah. Um, that there's been a lot of work, a lot of advocacy. A, a lot of politi political action and things seem to have shifted. What was the role of business in that? Oh, I think business has an enormous role, not only historically, but now going forward as well, in what, what we control within our four walls, in our workplaces, um, just speaks volumes about what we believe in and what we, you know, and our inclusive nature Think about the fact that our employees everywhere in the world go home at night and they come back in the morning. They go home at night and come back in the morning. Some go home into communities that are very tolerant and inclusive. Others go home at night into communities where it is not that way. That ebb and flow over time is what I think about is how we will change the world on LG, LB, LGBTI inclusion everywhere in the world. It's, I think what we do within our four walls is critical. Tell us a little bit about the work that you've done to advance those issues at EY and, and beyond. Well, you know, I only came out as gay in 2011, so eight years ago, very late in my career. I was 52 years old. Um, just thought my private life was my private life. Had been married for 13 years to a man, so I had the greatest cover in the world in my entire <laughs> career to say I'm divorced. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I honestly didn't stress about, this wasn't, a, oh, I need to come out, I never, I just never thought, I would never have come out. Um, can I tell a quick story about? Go for it. Okay, because it sets the context for the, the answer to your question. So, so our, I'd always been a very strong straight ally to our LGBT group at EY. So the leaders of our LGBTI group came to me and they said, look, we're gonna do a video for the Trevor Project. The It Gets Better campaign, many of your companies probably did it, where we all did these videos, some of our LGBT professionals told their story about how their life gets better. Uh, and then, so our leaders said, we're gonna do this at EY, do our video, five or six of our LGBT leaders will tell their stories and will you be the senior straight ally closer on the video? Huh. <laughs> I'm like, sure, fine, uh, you know, n no problem. Apparently Beth is also an actor. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, a and so fast forward two months and I'm on a plane and I'm looking at what I got to do the next day and I pull out the file, look, I, there's this video script that I'm supposed to read the next day into the teleprompter, written by the team from the perspective of a straight ally. And so I read it and I had had a glass of red wine which probably made all the difference in the world. Um, but I read the script and I said, wow, if I was being honest, that's just not what I'd say. And so I pulled out my EY pad and I started writing about what I would say. And yeah, it started off, yes, I'm gay. I'm not entirely comfortable with that and I may never be, but that's not the point. Here's the point, you're different. The world is trying to make you gay teen at risk of suicide. The world is trying to make you feel like you don't belong, like you're less valuable just because you're gay. No, you are valuable because of that difference, not in spite of that difference. And EY welcomes that different perspective. And, um, thank but thank you. I realize though where that came from authentically was me joining a profession in 1981 that there were very few women. I was one of the few. Um, there were very few Democrats. I was one of the few. There were very few introverts. I was one of the few. So I had, had sort of a, a long career of being included at EY even though when uh, everybody was in right field, I was in left field. Every, uh, just all the time. But the, the firm valued me for it. I was always, my views were welcome. So, so long story, wind of story, sorry. So, so I record the video, I go to the video shoot the next day, record, the, say what I wanna say, and it's just the cameraman, the head of our LGBT group and me, okay? So I'm now out. 
to the head of our LGBT group and the cameraman. Um, <laughs> yeah, which isn't really out. <laughs> but so, so then a month, a month later, so that video's in the can. A month later, we're, I'm going to accept an, an award for EY at the Trevor Gala that night. And then the video's going to go public the next day. So I have a month to think about this. And our LGBT leader's in my office every day for a month going, you sure you want to do this? You sure you want to do this? <laughs> Like, your life's going to change. You sure you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah. I, I mean, I really didn't. I'm like, the, because the message was so important to me about difference and the importance of difference. So you get to the night of the Trevor Gala. My partner at the time who I was with, um, we almost broke up the weekend before the night of the Trevor Gala because she was convinced my life was going to end, that, that I, I, there would be such backlash I thought I was a coward and a hypocrite for having been closeted for 52 years. So I was ready to be judged very harshly by the LGBTI community for having been a coward and a hypocrite. So I go to this dinner three quarters of the way through knowing I am going to say a sentence that as a leader who is gay and prepared to be booed and then for my career and my life to end. And that's how I approached it. So going to the gala three quarters of the way through the speech as a leader who is gay. And I hear, like, way back there, somebody yells, and then way back there, somebody yells. And I'm like, here it comes. Here come the booze. Here it comes. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, there's this, and then it's a five-minute standing ovation. And I stood there on the stage, just tears pouring uncontrollably, because it's 52 years of silence broken. And in that moment, life sort of went from black and white to full color. And it's how it felt. Um, but... No, thank you. But the importance of that moment was in that moment and with the reaction that followed, the positive, I, I suddenly went, oh my gosh, such a duty and obligation with the platform that I have, being a very senior leader in a very big company around the world, I have such an obligation to make sure no one else lives their life in black and white. And... And so when you say, you know, sort of now back to your question, like, what That's do you okay. Do? I liked what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's that. So then what do you do with that? So it made me realize, though, EY, EY had been so inclusive. We're one of the leaders on these issues. But it took one of the most senior executives in the firm to come out for our employees, I think, to trust our words. And, and it unleashed our organization to take what we were doing to a new level around the world. And so it really demonstrated to me the importance of not only support and all the right policies and all the right things. It, you need out senior out leaders who are doing more than just being out. They are being visible role models, willing to you know, be visible and move the needle around the world. So that, that is critical, I think. And then what we've done then is so then I'd, I'd been going to Davos as part of the UI delegation probably for 12 years. But then after coming out, found the handful of senior executives at Davos, handful that were openly gay. But th there was just a handful of us. But we found each other. Uh, Dan Bross, the executive director for the Partnership for Global LGBTI Equality, is here. Um, he was at Microsoft, one of the senior executives at Microsoft at the time. This, this handful of us found each other and said, you know what? Our companies can change the world on this issue. And we started working behind the scenes to try to get the LGBTI agenda to be recognized at the World Economic Forum. At that time, it wasn't being talked about anywhere. When I heard the word transgender in Davos this January, I nearly fell out of my chair because it, it was a big shift. Yeah. Let me just say that, obviously a very powerful story and I think the particularity of it is really important, but the universality of it is also very important. That, that what the story you just told spoke to um, an authenticity and, and very personal nature of communication, which I think is just so central for leadership mm -hmm. in, in our times. 50 years ago, that didn't happen. Agreed. But th th that kind of um, very heartfelt, very personal um, sharing of one's own circumstances is, it is a changing nature of leadership that we need badly. It is, and I will tell you, I was dead wrong. I thought I was a very authentic leader. What I learned in coming out is you are not authentic unless you are totally authentic and people can see it. I have become such a better person, but a better leader. My, what I didn't realize is 
your, our, our, my team couldn't engage me. You know, I mean, I thought they could, but they really couldn't because you think about the way your teams engage you. They really know you. Well, they couldn't know me. I, I did, wouldn't let them know me. The board, I'd been on the EY's global board for 15 years. It was like I was on a different board after I came out. And, it's, and here I was kind of always worried about walking into the boardroom and going, oh, there's the gay one. You know, and suddenly it was like, how's Michelle? Yeah. How are you guys? What are you doing? You know, and I, suddenly I was one of them, and I didn't realize I wasn't. Yeah. So. Absolutely wonderful. Um, we're going to rapidly run out of time, so I, I want to ask a couple more questions. We also invite you, use Twitter, hashtag BSR19, if you want to uh, pose a question uh, for Beth. We've got to talk about PGLE. Yep. Why don't you tell the audience about PGLE? What does it do? Why is it important? And we would love to have more companies join in. Enormously important, and I want to thank BSR for your, all of your work with us and support. We're, but, we're proud to house it. Thank you. But this, this story about Davos and the handful of us that found each other, I, the, so the PGLE, Partnership for Global LGBTI Equality, is in collaboration with the World Economic Forum. So this is a group that was formed in collaboration with the World Economic Forum after five or six years of working behind the scenes with senior leaders at just a handful of companies. This, com this organization was founded in January of 2019. Can you believe that? The World Economic Forum just agreed to do it this January. So we have there in collaboration with them, we can use their channels of distribution, their brand, they're now in the mainstream, on the main stage in Davos and into the mainstream of the programming at the World Economic Forum, which as you know, if an issue isn't discussed within the World Economic Forum, it sends a huge message to world leaders. It sends a huge message that it is not important, that they don't have to pay attention. Now they do, and we have that sort of weft. So it's founded by seven companies. Um, we uh, are signing on more, we want more, we have 14 now, but what are we committed to do? We are committed to change the world for LGBTI inclusion around the world, not by competing with other LGBTI organizations, but by amplifying and lifting, by using the, the platform of the World Economic Forum, both in Davos, but also regionally and around the world, um, also working with the UN, um, trying to get these companies to, you have to have signed on to the UN standards in order to join the partnership. How many companies have signed on to that now? A couple hundred, I think. Yeah, yeah. 200 and... 270. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dan. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I knew we would know that. Um, 270. Our goal is to get many, many more and, um, and then to work around the world, both not only in sharing best practices among the companies, but their strength in numbers. So with the platform of the World Economic Forum, the power of the UN, and then finally the strength in the companies working together, where when you combine our, the the, the uh, economies, the corporate economies of those 14 countries, we're bigger than most, a lot of countries. So tremendous power, and it takes me all the way back to when we control what we do with inside our four walls at those companies, think about that in a, pick your country, when those employees go home at night, come back in the morning, and those 14 companies are working together and many more companies to come, that is how we'll change the world. In Davos a couple of years ago, Vice President Biden met privately with those of us working behind the scenes. And he sat down with us and looked us in the eye. And he said, you can do, you companies can do what we government cannot and will never do. You have to change the world on this issue. So I think it's that critically important. We invite all of you to have your companies talk to Dan and I about um, what joining the partnership looks like. Um, we're very excited about the potential because as we've seen in the U.S. on this issue, there is, there is a tipping point yeah. on this. Because yeah. this is an invisible difference versus a visible difference, there really is a tipping point where you get momentum, momentum, momentum. And then when it feels safe, everybody just, boom, they come out and, and you really can go quickly. And, you know, your story, there are people in the world who are feeling the same pressures that you had previously, except the consequences for coming out are significantly, you know, are, are potentially life and, life and death. I want to ask about that. So the companies that are participating are global companies. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to talk about this issue in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's another thing to talk about in parts of Africa and Asia and elsewhere in the world. Can, what's the role of a big global company try to move the needle in cultures where uh, the LGBTI community is, is at risk, sometimes yep. by very explicit government policy, not only culture. 
that's what's so exciting about this partnership is our commitment is to start to go from the easy to the hard. Like it's, it's, it's funny in the LGBTI agenda now, you're noticed more by your absence than your presence. Um, you know, there's pink washing and, you know, so people are now watching actions, not trusting words. And, and so our commitment is to start together to go from the easy to the hard. There's strength in numbers. We can do this together without as much risk of backlash in a particularly difficult country. But through quiet diplomacy, this isn't, you know, go in, wag finger, you know, a lot of this... Corporates are very good at quiet diplomacy, knowing when to speak publicly, but also when to pull levers privately and how to make change. And, um, you know, we do that on a lot of issues. This is this will be similar. And did you fan out um, this issue throughout the EY community globally? Did we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and and what the key, I mean, there was really a recipe for success. It took it took grassroots people on the ground. We had to have LGBTI people on the ground um, who would speak kind of around power, speak truth to power and globally, so that I, I could be involved in pushing levers and kind of help have the chair and CEO ask questions at the right time and, and, get our, and then do roundtables and things. We'd get our local leaders comfortable, make it safe, show them it was okay, um, rather than just force and tell. We would have to show them the path to safety. And, um, and I think we, all of our companies have kind of similar approaches yeah. Corporate diplomacy is a powerful tool and often underappreciated and underused, I would say. Underused, yeah. but I've, I, you know, I've heard so much conversation at this conference about that. I think there's a real growing recognition yeah. that on a lot of these issues, corporate diplomacy is I invaluable. Agreed. We, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, one, I think, flows from this. What, what do you think allies and companies, large and small, uh, can do to make sure that everyone feels that they belong in in their work culture, because diversity, I mean, you talked about being an introvert. Diversity is not only about, you know, the body that you're born into, but also oh. your, your personality, your work style, et, et, et cetera. So how, how can allies help ensure that there really is an environment where everyone feels valued? Allies are critical, just critical. I think having a senior out, leader, out leaders is critical as well, but having allies is incredibly critical. Like I, what I like to say is, though, Closeted allies don't do any good. Hmm. Um, if, if you think about your closeted employees, a lot of people are very supportive allies. If you talk to them, they're very supportive, but they're closeted. They, and what I mean by that is they, they don't make their allyship visible. Uh -huh. And if you're a closeted employee, how do I know you're an ally if, unless you say so? <laughs> I mean, you have to, and you don't just say, I'm an ally, but, but you know, talk about you had dinner you know, with a gay couple last night and this and, you know, and because and, and, the closeted employees are, they're picking up everything and they're gauging every second of every day, is this a safe environment? And so unless you, you know, the pin is one thing, that helps, you know, shows you're visible, but talking openly says, I'm really okay with this. And, and um, I think a lot of the leadership I know at EY was frustrated, like, yeah, this great inclusive workplace, why aren't our employees just out? What's, what's the problem? And it's, it's really helpful to, to help the allies understand that the decision to come out is really complicated. The, the workplace can be as safe as anything, but if you've got a family situation that's not supportive or you're part of a community that's not supportive, what that employee's going, you have no idea all the factors that are perhaps keeping that employee closeted. All we can do is be as inclusive as possible. Let me, we've got just a bit, let me, the, the, the other question that we got is a good question and I think it's a chance <laughs> maybe to uh, come back to what your own personal journey has been. What was your first day at work like after you came out? <laughs> what did you do differently? Uh, I answered thousands of emails and calls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I wish to this day I had saved them and put them in a book. What I, what I was overwhelmed with um, is that every, it was from around the room and the story, it wasn't just, it, there were stories in every call or every email and the stories were all about difference. And they were from, they weren't just from LGBT, they were straight, you know, all walks of life, parents, Everyone shared a story about how when they walk out of the, basically I'd sum it up as when they walk out of the door in the morning, everybody feels a little bit uncomfortable, little sense of doubt. There's something on their shoulder they're a little um, lack of confidence about because the world has tried to make them feel different 
and like they don't belong rather than they, they do belong. And so it was stories that the video had so resonated with people about difference and that difference matters and everyone is different. Uh, and so that was it, was, it was the biggest aha day of just absorbing what reflected back. And it really wasn't about being gay, it was about being different. I am not going to get in the way of Beth's powerful words, words by trying to sum it up. That was such a great uh, way to, I think, inspire everyone and send some very important messages that we all, no matter who we are, no matter what we do, no matter how we think of ourselves, uh, can and should take to heart. So, Beth, I want to thank you for this and, moreover, all the great leadership that you show and the way that you show it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.